Welcome to Fatima, The Moment Has Come with Father Nicholas Gruner. A look at how the message of Fatima affects you today. Welcome to Fatima. The moment has come. Our special guest today is uh, Professor David Allen White. And welcome to our program, Professor. Thank you, Father. It's an honor to be here. Uh, Dr. White, you've written a, a book. I know the mouth of the line. It's a story of a bishop in South America. And I also you've written another book, I believe, as well, in collaboration about Shakespeare. I edited a Shakespeare encyclopedia, a Shakespeare A to Z, it's called, yes. So uh, besides teaching class for some 30 years, you've been writing, and I understand you're going to be writing another book soon as well. Yes, I'm uh, currently working on a biography of uh, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. And uh, the, uh, in, in your literature classes, you talk about the importance of stories and wh- why literature is so important and why. And so, and, and most of the literature concerns itself with stories in some way or another, doesn't oh, it? Oh, yes. And we all love storytelling from the time we're very little and um, even when we grow older, constantly going to the movies, watching TV, reading books, we entertain ourselves. But then each of us has a personal story as well, and yeah. that is a story of we begin life, we, we live through time, we die, and how we live in time determines where we will be in eternity. And uh, you perhaps, I don't know, maybe you have told the story before, but you have a very interesting story to tell about yourself. The fact that you started as Protestant, you went to atheism, and then finally became Catholic. Perhaps, perhaps you can give us some background on yourself and how you came, because Our Lady herself talks about conversion. She talks about the conversion of Russia and that Russia will be converted and there will be peace. But obviously Russia is not just uh, one country, it's a group of, a number of individuals making up that country and that the whole people will go through their conversion story. But you've perhaps pre, uh, not that you're the only one, but you've gone through the same thing. You've gone through this conversion, looking for God in the wrong places and finally finding God. Perhaps you could tell us your own story. Yes, well, I, I, was, I was born, so they tell me, uh, yes. in, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, a uh, Midwestern town, and uh, both my parents were Protestant. Yes. My father worked in a little corner grocery store meat market and uh, eventually bought it out, and my mother was a housewife, and so I was raised Protestant as they had been Protestant. I was raised Congregationalist. And yes. It was, it was a typical 50s upbringing in a way. There was a lot of order around me, a lot of neighbors, a lot of family. And um, even though I've now become a Catholic and moved away from that Protestant faith that I was raised in, in one way I'm grateful that my parents at least were Christian in their way because there was a great deal of love in, in the home. Yes. And I think that love in the home is extremely important for a child growing up. And knowing that you have your parents there to depend on. And the good part about being raised Protestant is that I was made to memorize Bible verses and lots of them. So as a a young man, I got the 23rd Psalm put in my head and the opening of the Gospel of John and the Christmas story. And so I was was filled with uh, the Christian message in that way. Yes. But I do think that there was a a downside as well. And... um, that was, church for me was um, really in, in, in an important way the music. I loved the music and I developed something of a love for music in going to church. I was bored by the sermons that seemed to me to be endless and, and uh, went on much too long. But I didn't really have any sort of intellectual basis for my faith. It tended to be an emotional reaction, um, the feelings that I had while I was there. And as a result, over time, um, I don't think I was firmly grounded in my faith. And I think that happens to many young people today. Sadly now, I think it's true for Catholics as well as Protestants. Many young people aren't getting a grounding in the faith now. Yes, and uh, and, and of course, uh, ultimately we're not just made up of emotions or uh, an appreciation for beauty, which is certainly uh, certainly a way to be brought to God by through music or uh, or, or, or beauty, either in nature or or man-made beauty, but realizing that's just a reflection of God's beauty, uh, is certainly one way to be drawn to God. And it's, I'm, we're not, but it's it's not enough. We also need, you know, many of us at least need to have an understanding why 
the faith, what is the content of the faith, and why we know that this is God who has spoken to us. And, and if they don't get that, then they think it's, it's based on nothing. That's absolutely correct. And what happens is that if you're relying on your emotions to defend your faith as well, your faith can easily come under attack. And obviously the, the devil is out there roaming the world, uh, yeah. waiting for souls to devour. Yes. And one way to do it is to attack someone whose faith is weak. Yes. And in a sad way, I, I do feel that that's what happened to me over time. Uh, particularly when I got out of that sheltered area of the home. And while there had been love there and, and order and um, a real sense that the faith meant something in terms of my heart, my head was pretty empty. Uh, even though I had, I had received very good grades, um, even though I had been given a, a, a great, um, great deal of a kind of solid education, uh, reading, writing, and arithmetic, I got, I got the basics. I wasn't intellectually, intellectually prepared to go out into the, into the world. Curiously, there was one, one woman, one teacher, who was very important in my life, and I realize now, many years later, how important she was. She taught in the public schools. But I think in some ways, I, I call her now a secular nun. I'm surprised she didn't become a nun. She was Catholic, yes. very imposing, a tall lady with gray hair, and as was possible in those days, always had the ruler in her hand ready to uh, take on any of us unruly children. I talk to my Catholic friends now who tell me about their Catholic upbringing, and she sounds like the typical nuns in most of the Catholic schools. Well, she made us learn grammar, she made us learn how to write, but most importantly, she taught me Shakespeare for the first time. Little did I realize she was giving me my vocation. And when she saw my love of literature, she was very kind, spent a lot of time with me. But I realized what I was getting from her was not just a good education, but also Catholic example that had to do with discipline, a very disciplined life and the importance of discipline, but a great deal of love in order to uh, nurture another soul along the road. And I am I'm indebted to her. Um, I, I, I pray that God grant her good rest. She's gone to her reward now, but... She gave me more than uh, I, can, I can ever return, although I try to now, in a Catholic way, by praying for her now that she is gone. And of course, also being a good example to your students as well in the Naval Academy in Annapolis, as well as giving them a love for, uh, for good literature, because ultimately good literature should lead people back to God if it's really good literature. It's absolutely correct. And uh, what I began to realize at that point, it was, it was a Catholic truth she was teaching me something that I didn't know at the time but realize now, and that is the mystery of the mystical body of Christ operating in this world. Yes. And um, she may be gone, but she is still part of the mystical body, and I feel in some ways everybody is connected with her now, as I did when she taught me in 8th and ninth grade in that, in that public school. It shows the importance, and you know, our, one of the messages of Our Lady is that we uh, do our daily duty. This, in fact, our Lord himself explained to Sister Lucy in the 1940s, and it just shows the importance. We don't know what influence we have by being a good teacher, a good parent, a, a good worker, wherever we are. And so that's important for us to realize. In, in the life, we'll see this more as we talk with, with Dr. White and his conversion uh, to Catholicism. But first, we go to the next day when he becomes an atheist. We'll be back in a moment with Dr. White's story. Join us for the experience of a lifetime. Take a spiritual journey and visit the holy sites where our Blessed Mother appeared, bringing her words of hope and warning for mankind. Space is limited, so call the number on your screen now and find out how you can join us. All tours are accompanied by a Marian priest as your spiritual guide. Pilgrimages to Portugal, Spain, and Italy are scheduled for this year. Call 1-800-263-8160 and take the first step of your spiritual adventure today. We've been talking with Dr. White about his conversion from Protestantism to Catholicism, but going through the road of atheism. What happened then? You, you were raised by good uh, Protestant uh, parents, and you were in the, your home in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And what happened that made you leave Protestantism and become an atheist? Well, what happened was I went off to the university. I got my undergraduate degree from the University of Minnesota, which is at, was at that time simply a typical big university. And I thought it would be very exciting. I had been told always that this was an important step in my life, that I was going to finally move into that intellectual realm and I'd be, I'd be studying with um, ver the very best teachers. 
Well, sadly, I had very little intellectual preparation for that, and it was during the 60s, a time of upheaval and disturbance, and um, as a result, I had no way to challenge anything I heard, and the basic premise of modern education is scientific in nature, it is atheistic in nature, there is not a God, we are in control of this world, we plan our own affairs, we live our own lives, we are our own masters. And that was what came to me, and I, I bought into it, hook, line, and sinker. I came to believe I was in charge of my life. I was pretty smart, I thought. Being smart, I could determine what I wanted to do. And little by little, uh, left all of that I had been taught behind, uh, gave it up, began to think it had all been bunk. There was no truth in any of it, other than the being nice part, that we should still be nice to each other. But even as I thought that, my ego was becoming monstrous and going out of out of control, and I was becoming pretty cocky. Um, the inevitable end of that, of course, because of all the temptations of the world, particularly at a modern university and particularly in the 60s, um, a time of indulgence. And I came to believe that um, what I really should be doing was enjoying myself in this world. And then came the temptation of giving in to all the passions. Yeah. And they were available all around, I think, at almost every university in the country at that time. And they still are. It's and, too much uh, a part of university life these days. In fact, in the universities uh, today, I, I went to McGill myself. And, uh, but uh, the upheaval, I think, perhaps is more in the uh, maybe the later 60s. But... Uh, going back to university life some a uh, few years ago, I was amazed to see what transpired, which would never be tolerated when I was on campus some 30, 40 years ago. Well, there have been major changes, and I, I was there from 66 through 70, and those, I think, really were the years of transformation. What I've discovered now, it's not like this at the Naval Academy, because it is a place of some discipline, and the, the students have strict requirements, but in most schools, I hear of, from other students or from friends of my midshipmen, uh, you go to the university to party and occasionally take a class on the side if you're awake enough in the morning to get up and go to it. And that's very much my experience in, in the 60s. I went to the classes, but um, it, it, was, it was too much of the good life. And I was setting habits for my future then that were not good ones. And uh, on to graduate school, becoming even more sure of myself and even more set in, in ways that were not God's ways. And then got a, a fairly good job teaching at Temple University in Philadelphia. And I was uh, simply broadcasting all of those uh, intellectual lies that I had had pounded into me. I was um, teaching things that simply were not true. And at the same time, my personal life began to deteriorate in a, in a very bad way. I was out for myself and had very little concern for others. Um, I was drinking too heavily. I was indulging in the, the passions of the flesh. What the modern world says uh, really is, is what we're entitled to do if we want to, but that is very clearly against God's law, which teaches us to discipline the passions, yes. and only through that can you come to real freedom of any kind. Yes. Yeah, when people become slaves of their passions, and whether it's drink or whether it's uh, sins of the flesh or whatever, they... Uh, without God, without grace, we, they can't get out of it. And of course, uh, but as long as we're not even trying to get out of it, we're not going to get out of it either. And of course, if the the modern university is telling you to indulge your passions, to do what you want, and this is the way to go, then, I mean, this is the biggest lie of all, because you're telling people to go into the prison of being a slave to your passion, not being rational, not being that everything you do is only to gratify yourself. And, and, and as long as this lie is bought at the intellectual level, of course, there's never going to be an attempt to try and get out of it. But, but uh, this also left you, less, led you to atheism as well. How did that, did they actually become formally atheistic? So yeah, it? insofar as I, I no longer believed that God existed. There was only, there was only the material world. There was only nature. Um, there, there was only the, the sweep of time, accident, and chance. I, I fell for the, um, the, the, the really big lie that um, man is here by accident and that uh, we are here for a br very short time and that there is very little meaning behind anything we do there other than our own experience. And therefore, you should experience as much as you can, as intensely as you can, without any idea that there might be a moral order and that experience can be good or bad and does relate to something higher. 
And so, uh, for example, uh, as you spoke, it reminded me of the great lie about evolution, you know, that everything only just evolved, it all was an accident. And so, of course, this is sort of the pervading intellectual atmosphere of a lot of places, a lot of schools, a lot of universities. And, uh, it's but that's, their religion, yeah, I think, it, yeah. Father. It's their yeah. religion. And then the, the whole idea in the Freudian part of their religion, which is, you know, uh, just gratify yourself because that's what you're here for. And, it's, and if you don't, you're going to injure yourself if you don't gratify yourself in the, with all sorts of sins and so forth. And it leads inevitably to atheism because if you believe those things, you are cutting yourself off from God. Yeah. And the more you cut yourself off from God, the easier it becomes to just pretend he's not there. And ultimately, you are decreeing, you make the decree, I'm here, but God doesn't exist, which is the biggest lie of all. And then, of course, it leads from there, almost, I don't know if it led in your case, but the, the, the other, the third member of the Troika between Darwin and Freud would be Marx, which would be then, and impose this atheism on everybody else at the force of at the point of a gun uh, with with communism and so forth and it certainly it certainly happened to me. I went through my socialist phase where I was uh, reading George Bernard Shaw and becoming a, an avowed socialist and uh, never quite all the way to marxism but it 's a very tiny step from one to the other and again, I was promoting that big lie that we could could somehow create a perfect world here on earth that if there was a heaven, it would have to be made here and again that 's a gigantic lie that only leads to trouble for nations and for individuals. So we were talking, in fact, in, in Russia and Solzhenitsyn, actually Dostoevsky talked about seeing this himself, having been a socialist in the 19th century, saying it would lead to 100 million corpses, and he was wrong. It was 110 million corpses, in the, and of course Solzhenitsyn ties that in, talking about the description of what he sees himself being in those, in those prisons, the slave labor camps. But, but from there, what, something must have brought you out of that, and we'll have to talk about that in a moment with Dr. White, how he came out of atheism to Catholicism, and we'll be back in a moment. Join us for the experience of a lifetime. Take a spiritual journey and visit the holy sites where our Blessed Mother appeared, bringing her words of hope and warning for mankind. Space is limited, so call the number on your screen now and find out how you can join us. All tours are accompanied by a Marian priest as your spiritual guide. Pilgrimages to Portugal, Spain, and Italy are scheduled for this year. Call 1-800-263-8160 and take the first step of your spiritual adventure today. We've been talking with Dr. White about his conversion, his conversion from atheism to Catholicism. Let's ask now, Dr. White, what actually caused that to happen? Well, I would say it's God's grace that caused it to happen. Yes. Uh, for some reason, God decided he wasn't going to let me get away, but he, he used a most unusual method. I was in the classroom and spouting what I realized now was... Um, the standard party line. That's what I had been trained in and drilled in. And then one day I confronted a student who began challenging me. And not only did he challenge me in terms of what I was saying, he would come back with rather different ideas from anything I'd encountered before in, um, in my years of teaching or from any other student. And all I can say is that God's grace led me to listen to him instead of trying to shut him up. And often if you have a student that's talking more than you are in class or is taking over the class, it's standard educational procedure to try to quiet him down. In this case, the student was making so much sense that I became interested. And in fact, on occasion it would reach the point where I would come into the classroom to give a lecture and ask him the question I had on my mind and stand at the podium and take notes. I guess what... (laughs) I guess one, one thing you could say is that it was an act of humility because the teacher was sitting out there and I was, I was for the first time in my life feeling as if I was learning something absolutely new and being told things that I had um, no real understanding of. And much of what he was doing was attacking that whole socialist agenda, the notion that we are merely here for material well-being and comfort, that success is the most important thing in the world and that we can determine our own end, our own future, and everything about the world around us. And it was very clear that he had a different agenda in his mind. I I learned later, he himself was coming out of atheism and was moving towards a belief uh, in God and specifically the Catholic Church. And it was a a real turning point in my life. And so... uh this was during your lectures as a university professor yes. teaching English literature, I imagine. English literature, yes, indeed. Yeah. And we finally, we had a confrontation, in fact. Um, 
I was teaching Shakespeare, which remained a great love, and I had carried it with me from that uh, junior high school teacher who introduced it to me. But I was also spouting George Bernard Shaw, the great British socialist. And this student made the point to me that I could not hold them both up as equally good because they were giving out contradictory messages. He was teaching me about Aristotle's law of contradiction, which I'd never really been taught, yes. that two contradictory ideas cannot both be true. Yes. And he said to me, you have to accept one or the other, either the, the world view of, of Shakespeare, which is a very spiritual view, and I'm convinced a very Catholic view, which I did have some grounding in without fully understanding, and the Shavian view, which is that of a socialist world order. And um, I pondered it over time and finally realized he, he was quite right. And there was more to the world than just mere matter. Yes. That there had to be a designer, uh, there had to be a creator, there had to be a God, and if he was out there, he had to speak to us in some way. There had to be a way by which we could know what he intended for us to do. And um, I, was, I was led finally, well, quite, quite honestly, to uh, the vision of our Lord. And... Um, suddenly for the first time in my life took the fact of Christ as second person of the Trinity, uh, the God-man, quite seriously, and it, it began to change my life. Yes. And so uh, what is it that you could say for someone, obviously there's many students in universities today uh, who have perhaps mirrored your experience, I mean, being raised uh, in believing in the Bible and yet leaving their home and then uh, being taken in by the the establishment or the university establishment, not that everybody in the university is doing this, but there is a whole stream of thought and, and even a conspiracy of almost to, to take the faith away from the, the youth and, and tell them that, that they're the masters of their own fate, there's no God, and telling them that, that, uh, you know, that all that stuff that you learned from your parents is bunk. What would you tell them? to? Uh... Two things. One, um, get back to the real intellectuals. Study the real intellectuals. What happens in too many of the universities is you're given phony baloney. No, you know, it's, no matter how you slice it, it's still baloney. And you're reading second or third or fourth rate minds. It was crucial to, for me to discover Dostoevsky, to get back to reading Shakespeare, uh, reading some of these very, very great writers who clearly do have a larger vision, but on an even more practical level, I would tell the young people, no matter what is happening, even if you have doubts, keep praying. And I realized what happened to me is I broke that connection with God. If they're Catholic, they should be praying the rosary. If they weren't raised Catholic, they should still be praying whenever possible, asking God for guidance. Because I've discovered over the years that anyone who truly seeks, who wants to know the truth, and asks God for help, will be given that guidance. Well, the Lord says, asking shall receive, seeking shall find, knocking shall be open to you. And of course, his word, our Lord says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. His words are infallible. And so obviously, if we ask, and if we ask sincerely, he will show us. And that's indeed what happened. Uh, my life turned around, needless to say, and I, I, can, um, I can tell you that one of the great moments in my life after receiving instruction from a wonderful uh, old Irish Monsignor named Monsignor Dean in one of the Philadelphia suburbs, I made my first confession at the age of 31, and I was in that confessional for a long time, but uh, God received me back home. And for, for a Protestant and then an atheist, to go through the experience of the sacrament of confession for the first time was a very, very powerful moment in my life. And I think uh, God nearly knocked me over with his grace. And um, then the very next morning, I um, made my first communion. And suddenly, um, the, the sacraments were real to me. They were no longer just a, an idea. Yes. But uh, the sacraments became the real source of grace, and God be praised, over the years, as by staying close to the sacraments, I've never doubted anymore. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm still far from being a perfect man, but I know when I fall where I have to go, that confessional and, and the priest is there waiting for me. Yes. And on Sundays at Mass, receiving the Eucharist, um, the body and blood of our Lord, makes it possible to uh, live through all that life hands you and prepare yourself for that world that's to come. Perhaps you'd like to describe, if you can, some of that experience of that in the confessional or, I mean, first of all, some people are frightened by the confessional, it's sort of that black box, and they say, well, what can go well, on? Well, it, it yeah. seems frightening, but it's quite the contrary. The fear is inside you because you know what you've done. Yeah. The wonderful thing is that the priest is there in the person of Christ, 
And what you discover is you're finally going in there and dumping all that sin. And it's our Lord taking it on himself as he already has, uh, having died for it and now being willing to forgive you. And I can tell you that no amount of fear going in um, can, can outweigh that glorious sense of leaving it behind you as you come out and being freed from it. That's great. We'll be back in a moment to talk about the conversion and what this means for us in our time and the conversion Our Lady promises for the whole world. We'll be back in a moment. Join us for the experience of a lifetime. Take a spiritual journey and visit the holy sites where our Blessed Mother appeared, bringing her words of hope and warning for mankind. Space is limited, so call the number on your screen now and find out how you can join us. All tours are accompanied by a Marian priest as your spiritual guide. Pilgrimages to Portugal, Spain, and Italy are scheduled for this year. Call 1-800-263-8160 and take the first step of your spiritual adventure today. We've been talking about the conversion of Dr. White, and I'd like to thank Dr. White for being with us. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Father. My pleasure to come and let the viewers know there's always a way home. Yes, and in fact, uh, you know, some people have the idea of professors being up on the podium on the pedestal, and, and perhaps they don't really know that all the professors have their own story and have their own humanity, and it's very important for us to realize that God is reaching out to each one of us, and God wants us to come home to him. Dr. White went through uh, becoming an atheist before he became uh, faithful to God and to the Catholic Church by his conversion. He did this by having the sense to listen to the truth when he could hear the ring of truth, even though it was coming from a simple and lowly, shall we say, student, even though he was a professor in the class. And let us remember his great lesson about the importance of prayer. Prayer is so important in our time. And, you know, if we are, uh, if we need some guidance, we all do. And if you find yourself lost or confused, I'd urge you to call us at 1-800-263-8160, and we will be able to pass on to you literature and give you some answers, or at least get, put you in direction of people who can help you. Please call us at 1-800-263-8160, and remember to pray the rosary every day. He who prays will be saved. He who does not pray will be lost, as St. Alphonsus teaches. God bless you, and pray the rosary every day. Thank you. May God bless you, and may our Heavenly Mother Mary draw you ever closer to our Divine Son, Jesus. Benedicat vos omnipotens des, pater et fidius et spiritus sanctus. Amen. I've lit a special candle before Our Lady for your special intentions. And let us remember that there is no problem in the world, no matter how big or how small, that cannot be solved by the rosary. We are assured of this in the message of Fatima. Let us pray the Hail Mary together for your special intentions. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. For more information about Fatima, call us at 1-800-263-8160.